This podcast is for anyone that knows they haven't yet found and offered up their best work, but are compelled to seek it out and do it. Are you ready to move your desk? But it's, it's great to talk to you and introduce you to the audience because you were, what would I call you? My personal brand coach? Yeah, yeah your year. brand coach. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. I've taken all of it to heart. I'm just in the middle of trying to figure out some next steps right now. So I've kind of pulled back a little bit. I would like to uh, give you a couple minutes so that you can introduce yourself before we get into talking about a very special book that's just come on the market. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much. It is so good to be with you. Thank you for this. You know, um, I, so Jennifer Anderson, I've got about 26 years helping people with the strategy around what are they doing as a leader? What are they doing to develop that career path? And what's interesting about it is that it's not always just for themselves. Sometimes it's for their team too, right? It's like, okay, you know, we, we want to do this together. And so I offer workshops and coaching. There's online courses. And then recently I have launched a new book, Call for Compassion. And this is all about building compassionate leaders for more collaborative workplaces. And so um, this is really fun to see this come to life. And for anybody who's written a book, it's like, <laughs> mama like you got to be really committed if you're gonna if you're gonna do that thing so right. uh, but I was and I, I had I had a very deeply impactful prompting from God to write the book and so I'm like okay whenever I'm on the Lord's errands like I can't not do the thing like I, I gotta do gotta do the thing and there were moments where I wanted to throw the towel in and and it was actually kind of funny because at one point I was like, oh, I'm showing compassion for myself as I'm struggling through writing the book and the revisions and the editing and working with editors and design. And I'm just a lot, a lot, a lot. So it's fun to have it out in the world now, but it's um, and it's an interesting addition to what I do with people, you know, like for you, like you were part of one of the personal brand boot camps. And innately skilled at helping people to identify their personal brand and then leverage it, right? Because it's all good. It's fine to have it. But then what are you doing with it, right? You know, so what I find is that there are a lot of people because I get a lot of people who come to my stuff that are, you know, we're all middle age, right? Like I'm 49, you know, just going to own it, you know? And so it's like people who show up and they're like, ah. I have not done a great job uh, with managing my reputation or even knowing what kind of reputation I want to have and how am I promoting that? And so I'm like, okay, time out. Just, hold on, just stop. You know, instead of flipping out about what all these things that went bad, it's like, okay, now we know. Now let's move forward, right? So we got to we got to do those things. And so, call for compassion. Um, it's fun. It's great to have it out in the world. You know, as you're talking, I'm remembering going through the boot camp and how, like looking back, going, wow, the compassion is an important part of everything you pursue, but especially like something like personal brand, right? Because I kind of fit into what you just said, like kicking myself mm -hmm. for so many years of not thinking about it. I was so engrossed and ingrained in the work. And then when you go and bother to learn more about yourself and kind of return to who you really are or yeah. really meant to be. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of shame involved and despair. And like, oh, like I wasted all these years. <laughs> and this guy is not a waste. I'm starting now. <laughs> this person's helping me discover things about myself I forgot. And then when you get that, like, I don't know, I feel like I kind of started to rush off going, okay, I'm going to start presenting myself like this, but I wasn't mentally ready. Mm -hmm. to accept it all. Now I'm starting to go, okay, what does this mean? How right. do I start acting into it? And then, then I feel like as I come out with it, like I'll resonate with the brand I'm putting out. So it's been a very interesting journey. And as you're talking, I'm like, oh yeah, like there's been these back and forth learning how to have more compassion with myself in the process, especially as I'm bothering to try to offer that to others, but you have to know how to do it mm -hmm. with yourself. 
You know, the, it, I love the cover, right? I, I rode a bike my whole life. I delivered papers. We had junky cars. So we were very motivated to ride our bikes instead of get a ride. <laughs> and so I really resonated with the, you know, using the bike throughout it. And I'm training for a triathlon right now. So the funny thing about it is when people were first saying, what's the scariest part of training? I said, oh, it's the running. So I'm fine with biking and swimming. But now the scariest part is, the triathlons in Idaho, and there's these things called goat heads in Idaho, uh -huh. um, and they're prickly, like really, you know, yes. and if those get in the bike tires, you're automatically flat, like in one second, boom, you're out. And so now that's my biggest worry. So as I was reading this, I was like, I wonder like what part of the analogy this fits yeah. into, but what I didn't realize is call for compassion is also an acronym, and that's how you organize mm -hmm. the book. But the C is for communication, choosing to listen more than you talk. Uh, o, open-mindedness, seeking to understand the other person's perspective. M, motivation, understanding what motivates someone as well as yourself. P, positive, choosing to see the good. A, attitude, choices, whoop, choices in your point of view. S, smile, projecting warmth and encouragement. S, sensitivity, being aware of others' needs. I, intention, living on purpose. O, optimistic, hope and confidence about the future. N, never-ending compassion, choosing compassion for the rest of your life. First of all, before we like pick one to delve into, did you have some experience that kind of led you to go, oh, I, I see compassion representing all of these things. Is there something that started yeah. this Sure. So with the 26 years of helping people with career stuff, all of these pieces and parts here within this acronym absolutely presented themselves multiple times, multiple situations. So it wasn't like these things showed up when I was in a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a client or when I was in a workshop or speaking somewhere. Like, it's not like Oh, every time I end up, you know, talking to, you know, let's say like a vice president of technology or something, inevitably we always get into communication. And so it wasn't, it wasn't just like, like that was the only time it was cross the board. These are core things. And so when the inspiration came to write the book and to, and to use this as an acronym, it was like, okay, it was like really easy to see how this all fits together. And so um, I've got, I've got like, I don't even know how many thousands of conversations I have had with people over the years. Mm -hmm. Like I, I kind of wish, in fact, I mentioned somebody the other day, I was like, I wish I kept like a tally mark somewhere of like all, every single conversation, you know, cause you kind of come point, like your calendar doesn't even, it's like back in the day, mm -hmm. like I wasn't even using an electronic calendar. Right. <laughs> you know? And so I, that information is gone, but showing myself a little self-compassion here. It's like, okay, I can't go back and recreate that. But it was, there are absolutely just themes that roll, you know, come through all of this kind of stuff. For sure. But which one really resonated with you when you were cruising through the book? All of them resonated. That was the interesting thing. But and because you also so shared stories along with each of them. And so I could like get a handle. But there, there's I wanted to talk about smile for a minute because I had an experience a week ago oh. where I was conscious because I've, I've been paying attention to my face going, wow, I, I have a furrowed brow a lot. <laughs> And so I'm like intense sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> mm -hmm. and so um, and so I like, okay, how do I come across? Like I realized that you can tell a lot how you come across by how people respond to you. And I've had different responses from people in the last couple of years that's really made me wonder like what's going on. And I know, you know, we go through stuff sometimes we don't realize we're expressing it as we go about our day, but mm -hmm. I made a choice one day as in a situation where I'm like, I want to smile right now just because I feel like it's the right thing to do. And the minute I decided to smile at everyone coming toward me, everyone changed like in an instant. And so you made that comment about um, something about four seconds. It's like four seconds worth of effort, like to smile. Yeah. And it was so immediate. Like there were people that were startled and they stopped what they're doing. They looked at me and they smiled. And there's others that just like seemed elated. I'm like, 
You mean I have the ability to change a room just by smiling and looking in someone's face, even if I don't know them. And mm -hmm. we know this kind of, but I had such an immediate reaction. I was like, wait a second. I need to show up doing this every day, even if I have to talk to myself and go, smile, show up, look in people's eyes. And it was such a wonderful yes. experience. Yeah. So I like seeing that as one of your things because the opposite of that is the negative impact of your demeanor. That's what I wrote down in my notes. You yeah. wrote something about that. And like, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, I love that. Oh my heck. I'm I'm totally feeling that for sure because Rebecca, you're so right. So right that it is that fast. It's that fast. And so the opening quote that I have in the book related to smile is this. Never diminish the power of a smile to benefit others and yourself. Right. So don't diminish that power, right? They're the benefit of the smile. And there's a absolutely a theme throughout the whole book of compassion for self in order to have compassion for others. Right. And so if you've got stuff, drama, trauma, whatever in your own, in your heart and in your experiences, if you're not dealing with that stuff, my friends, here's your public service announcement. It is going to come out somewhere else. You know what I mean? It is going to rear its ugly head. Okay. And so, and all of us are in that boat. All of us, even if you've done work, you know what I mean? And so coming back to this idea of smile is that sometimes you just need to smile, even though like there still might be some like crap going on. And it's okay. It's okay that there's some bad stuff that's going on. I remember years ago, so back in 2019, I was diagnosed with colon cancer. And then that led to me having part of my colon removed. And, and then I did chemotherapy and all that chemotherapy stuff happened when COVID hits and like we're all distancing and whatnot. And I am a creature of community. Give me my people, right? Give me, yeah, I, I need people. And I remember not being able to have access to people, but also having to wear a mask. So I started wearing a mask uh, because my oncologist is like, your immune system is like down to nothing. And so if you're going to be interacting with anybody, you know, even just going out to the grocery store or whatever, like, you know, like you have to wear a mask to protect yourself. So I'm wearing a, so I'm used to smiling, and nobody can see my smile, right? So I'm smiling really big with like the really big squinty eyes. Remember all that, that we were all yeah. up when stating it. <laughs> but it was like, ah, like I could, I could feel, uh -huh. I could tell that there was a difference there. I mean, I was still smiling, but I mean, if you're laughing, you know, people know you're smiling, you know, they can feel yeah. it, you know, they can't see it. But it was this really weird, bizarre time where we like couldn't see each other's mouths. And there's, there's a lot to that. There really is. I mean, there's all these studies showing up now about kids that their reading is off because they couldn't see. Like, how do you hold your tongue when you say L or R, you know? Oh. And there's like all of these things. Sorry, I'm totally going off on a tangent right now about the ability to see our mouths. What I'm going though with this is that this part of our face, it's, it is so socially connecting mm -hmm. with people. And so in the smile chapter, I talk about the neurological response of smiling, the social response of smiling and other parts too. But that social thing that happens, I feel like we have to smile for ourselves so that we can be there and to show up for other people too. And so, and sometimes like we just need to chill out. And sometimes like we're so intense, like you talked about the fur, you know, like the, the frowning that happens. And so like, think about that, like for a long time, a lot of us had our faces covered and the only thing we can see with our eyes and think of how many of us, I mean, I've got some, I got some kilo, killer, excuse me, furrow lines going on here. And these, <laughs> you know what I mean? And so, but again, I got 49 years of making these things. So this is, you know, I'm working on this. And so, but that's what we saw a lot of each other. And this, like this, like this doesn't hundred percent go away. I know people can do Botox. They got these like patches you can put on your face, you know, like there's all sorts of stuff. Yeah. 
right? Yeah, the brownies, yeah. And so, but then we can offset it with our smile, you know? And so when our smiles were covered up, it, it, it created this barricade of like that joy and happiness and that simplicity of just of what a smile brings. I think as you're talking, I'm realizing it's it shown us how important it is just to lift the corners of your mouth, yeah, right? right? Like it, it does, it does impact more than we think. And it, as humans, for some reason, we were mm-hmm. like, that was part of the creation, right? That somehow yeah. this would yeah. bring something <laughs> better to us. Right. It's so it's true. Our muscles also. I know. Yeah. And like, people are like, like oh, I got to get rid of my smile lines, you know, my wrinkles over here on the side. I'm like, what? I'm like, that's right. a good thing. Like we're smiling, <laughs> you know, those are, those are a good deal. Um, inside mm-hmm. of the, inside of the book, I quote from uh, the psychology study of smiling, psychological study of smiling. And it says this, the emotional data funnels to the brain, exciting the left anterior temporal region in particular, then smolders to the surface of the face where two muscles standing at attention are aroused into action. And the the zygomatic, these words are hard, zygomatic major, which resides in the cheek, tugs lips upward, and the orbicularis oculi, which encircles the eye socket, squeezes the outside corners into the shape of crow's foot. This entire neurological response lasts less than four seconds, but causes those who are the recipient of the smile to often mirror the response by smiling back. Yeah, I loved that. Yes, for sure. I was when when I was doing research and stuff, and I'm like, wait, what? Like, what's the science behind smiling? You know, like, yeah. what is this? So of course, I went on this crazy little rabbit hole. <laughs> That's another thing about doing a book. Like, you're like research and that I mean it's nuts all the things but when I was reading about that I was like that's less than four seconds and I'm not even having to think about it right like our brain's just like bam 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 yeah doing all these little things and you know and how it's um you know how it's making our you know our eyes get the crow's feet you know the smile the cheeks like the whole bit right and so and it it's that it goes that fast and so when I think about having more compassion and building these more collaborative workplaces and work teams, golly, something that takes less than four seconds can help just kind of calm things down a little bit. Let's leverage this amazing thing that we have. I've been looking a lot at like face yoga and body movement and stuff like that. And just really amazed as I learn more and going, wow, we have this all built into us to help us that we can make stronger, but it also, in this case, the smile benefits yeah. those we interact with as well. So it, it, I guess, and then hearing your, the quote from a scientific perspective, like even gives more depth to it for some reason for me to go, oh, wow, like this is a thing mm-hmm. and why not have this as another tool? It's an easy thing to do. And it, it actually, I'm assuming it, it helps our own, boost our own hormones, you know, like in a happy yeah, hormones. Or something. Right. You know, right. There's something to that. I really liked that, you know, all of them. I don't know if you have a favorite that you focus on. but Probably. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of like asking me to pick like a favorite child or something. So, um, <laughs> You know, what I'm thinking about people who are trying to level up in their life for people who are saying, okay, I'm going to, I'm doing the deep work. Right. So, and they're, and, and hi listeners, hi watchers. <laughs> Good job. You know, cause I feel like people who stop and intentionally say, I'm going to listen to a podcast. that's going to help me to understand something. Right. Or I'm going to watch this video on YouTube. Like that's our way of leveling up. Right. And so um, because seriously, like you can go on YouTube and you can get sucked into stuff that's really not going to be very helpful. Right. And so, you know, like I'll give an example. Just the other day I went on YouTube. I, I put videos on my YouTube channel all the time and I was in there and, and I <laughs> like defaulted to like this series of shorts that showed all these funny little things about movie stars and I'm pretty sure that I wasted like 10 minutes of my life watching these little videos. And then I was like, blah, 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 hold on a second. I'm like, why was I on YouTube again in the first place? Yeah, so much <laughs> distraction. Yeah, right. Exactly. Absolutely. And so and so in that moment, I had to show a little compassion for myself. Be like, okay, 
totally got sucked into the clickbaits, you know, I'm good. I'm going to get back on track. Right. And so, but where I'm going with it is this, is that I feel like for people who are stopping and saying, I want to improve, I want to level up this, something is not working and I don't know exactly how to fix it or, or maybe I do know how to fix it, but I'm just looking for a little bit of motivation or an idea or tactic or, you know, something. Right. And so, so I think about all of that inside of the compassion acronym, A stands for attitude. And I think that as we have an attitude of, you know what, I can do better, you know, and, and those, cause we can really, we really can choose our attitude. We really can't. We can't choose our emotions and feelings a lot of the times. It's very, very hard to do that because that's that's your subconscious talking to you and saying you know, like when you're feeling like, like anxiety or you're feeling like a really deep, profound melancholy. I'm choosing that word because my eight-year-old heard it the other day and she's like, what's melancholy? And I'm like, how do I describe that to her? Mm-hmm. Anyhow, but you know, I just that deep sadness, so a deep awareness of like something's off, right? And so you have that melancholy feeling. So like, you can't just be like, I'm good with that emotion. You know, like it's right. it's because it's teaching, it's telling you something, right? However, what I'm saying is you can choose your attitude a lot, right? Mm-hmm. And so even if stuff is tough and it's really hard, um, kind of tapping back into that story about my colon cancer experience, I chose to name my cancer Elvis. Yeah. <laughs> And so it was like that whole thing, like, ladies and gentlemen, Elvis has left the building, you know, like that kind of thing, right? That deep voice. And because my idea is like, my body is the building, right? And we're going to move Elvis out, you know, by doing all this, all this stuff. And I was posting poop emoji things online. And I mean, just like, I think the poop emoji, like, was like the emoji I used, like, at least 50% of the time when people would text me to check in, you know, and different things. And I did have a couple of people who said, you know, you're being, you're being pretty irreverent and, you know, little, and I was like, and listen, I'm like, when you get cancer, you do cancer your way. Okay. All right. That's, that's, that's you know, but once, once you've entered the cancer club, that's what I like to call it. It's a membership with lifelong benefits. Um, anyhow, but then you get to, you get to do cancer your way. And for me, I was like, I don't want to be that person who's constantly in a heap of tears on my bed. There were times like that for sure. And it sucked and it hurt and it was chemo sucks. Like, uh, like all the things, all the things. And so, in fact, I think chemotherapy was far worse than the actual, I like, I didn't even know I had cancer growing in me for years. You know what I mean? And then, you know, they found it in a, in a colonoscopy. And so where where I'm going with it is that choosing that attitude, right? So I was instead choosing the attitude of, well, if this happens to be the last days of my life, I personally, I want to, I want to eke out as much joy of my life as I possibly can, you know, because I choose that anyhow. I tend to choose towards going to having fun. I mean, yes, I'm serious. Yes, you know, things can be intense, you know, stuff like that. However, through it's like I often, I lean more toward joy. And so, so it felt really good to put attitude in this in the book of about call for compassion, because we do have a choice in our attitude. We can't choose how our coworkers are going to treat us. We can't choose how our boss is going to communicate or maybe not communicate. That's a whole conversation for another day, you know? And so like, you can't, you can't choose those things, but you can choose your response. You can choose your attitude toward, you know, those things you know that are, that are coming your way. It'll be interesting to hear what your thoughts are about this. We can choose our attitude. And I feel like there have been times where I've done a good job of that. In fact, I feel like I did a good job of that in my work. You know, you, you learn these things and you realize things you could do better, but sure. it was more like, Hey, we can do this no matter the challenge we can move forward. But the interesting thing to me was I started learning more about myself through coaching and different things. And I entered this period where I don't know. It's really strange. I don't know if it was from learning new things about myself or something, but instead of quickly changing my attitude, I decided to sink into the lower emotions of that for a little longer. Because sometimes people accuse me of like not feeling bad long enough, really quickly skipping to the good. 
I know, I think you address that in the story in the book too. Like, like it's okay to sit with some negative feelings mm-hmm. for some while. And, and I realized that I learned how to sit with them for so long that it was starting to create pity and shame and stuff in me that right. actually impacted how I then showed up with others, mm-hmm. right? Because it was in a period of transition where I'd been used to leadership roles going to non-leadership roles as an individual contributor is a very strange transition for me. I'm Mm -hmm. still in that and probably should go back to leadership because that's more of a sweet spot. But it was, it's been an interesting journey to go, oh, I need to go back to choosing my attitude. It shows that if you choose to experience the negative emotions, it's really important to choose to also go back to having the attitude of I can do this and everything. And it sounds like you did a good job of that with your cancer. Sometimes you're like, just a bad day. I'm going to stay in the badness tomorrow. Okay. Nope. Not going to sit around doing this. I'm going to. And so I think some of us are learning how to do that purposely, but if you're not on purpose, there could be a long-term effect. Right. Absolutely. Um, The I in compassion for the acronym is intention. I think that there are a lot of people who are not living intentionally, Rebecca. I think there are a lot of people who are in these really wonky, um, bad routines and it's wash, rinse, repeat, wash, rinse, repeat. And so there's, again, for the folks who are finding a podcast like this or, you know, are watching this online somehow, there's a reality that they're having of, oh, okay, what's what I have been doing how, how I have lived in the past is not serving me anymore. And I want it to look different going forward. Right. And yeah. so there's that, you know, what's, what's that intention that you're bringing, you know, to, to the table. So the, hold on a second. I'm just flipping in the book to intention here. And uh, I was looking, where's my intention notes? Where's yeah, there you oh, go. The rusted handlebars. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes. No. Yes. Yeah. So for the the listeners, you've heard us speak a few times about bike stuff. So there's an analogy of the whole parable that goes through the whole story, the whole book about a dad who takes his eight-year-old son to get a a bike for his birthday. And the dad drives past the bike store and the little boy is in the car, in the truck going, dad, wait, you passed up the bike shop. Like, aren't we going to get my new bike? And the dad said, Oh yeah, we're getting you a bike, buddy. Just you wait. And he pulls into the junkyard and the little kid's like, what are we doing here? Like, just what's up, you know? And so basically they find a bike and they restore it. And that's the parable through the whole, through the whole book. And each like major, com- major component of a bike. So think of handlebars, right? So handlebars are associated with the idea of intention. And you think of handlebars, like where you steer them, that's your intention of steering of where do you want to move your bike to, right? So it's kind of like in your life, like where, what are you steering toward? So the quote that I highlighted at the beginning of the chapter for intention is this, choose what is truly important to you, then lean into it and watch for the miracles. I was so deliberate about this quote. It was very intentional about this quote, but I'll bump. Okay. And so I think, Rebecca, there's a lot of people who are abdicating the responsibility of choice to somebody else. They're not choosing what is truly important to them. I agree. Right? And then there's a certain point where we kind of wake up and we go, oh, mama. Okay. Okay. This isn't good. This isn't good. And I have seen it happen with so many people, individual contributors. I've seen it with leaders. I mean, personal situations in the workplace, like, so many people that are not making the choice. And as I've dug in deeper and like looked like, okay, well, why, why aren't they doing it? Right. So I'm like really just trying to peel back the layers, peel back, like what is going on? I think that we're pretty dang scared to choose Mm -hmm. what we think is really important to us because it's like, well, what if I put my ladder on the wrong wall and I get to the top of the ladder and I realize, shoot, wrong wall after all this time and effort, you know, think about like growing up through a bit, you know, through a company, right. And, and you move yeah. one rung to the next, or maybe that wall 
you know, maybe it doesn't, doesn't work. Like for those of us who've gone through a divorce, right? Like I was married to somebody for many years, went through a divorce. Now I'm remarried. We're, we're, we'll have our, celebrate our 10th wedding anniversary later this year. I thought I put my ladder on a good wall. You know, I thought I was building yeah. something pretty good, you know, and then it didn't happen, you know? And so, so I just moved, you know, I took my, took my ladder and went somewhere else. <laughs> and so, but, and I'm not trying to make fun of divorce, right? That's not what I'm, that's not what I'm trying to do. Right. I'm just simply saying that a lot of times people in those situations can then complain about their ex-spouse or they can then complain about what their boss is doing instead of stopping and recognizing, but what's my part in this, right? And so, and that to me, when you start living a life like that and you recognize and you start choosing what's important to you, right? And furthermore, coming back to the quote where it says, then lean into it. So then you start leaning into, okay, I've decided this is what's important to me. Now, what am I going to do to show the world that this is what's important to me? But I think mm-hmm. it's really to show the world if we can't first show ourselves. And then, and then what do people do? They zone out, they're eating and drinking through their emotions. They're watching Netflix all night. They're staying, you know, and then, you know how it is with Netflix. You go from one episode to the next. Next thing you know, it's two o'clock in the morning and you're like, holy cow, I got to get up at six o'clock, <laughs> you know? And so, so like, we're totally, totally desensitizing ourselves to things, but it's because of that lack of intentionality, the lack of choosing what's important and without that knowledge of what's important, then what are you going to lean into? Yeah. And I think um, you're bringing up, there's so many different thoughts I'm having, because I feel like um, we've gone through this era of the COVID that changed. A, a lot of people woke up, I think. It was a period where a lot of people woke up and were like, wait, wait, am I defaulting to living a certain life? How do you wake yourself up without having an extraneous life event, right? And I think that's something where most of us wake up because there's something that happens and then we're like, oh, and even those of us who think we're intentional have lived in an area for a while where everybody thinks you do things a certain way. You know, you all, the, the kids go to preschool, you do this, you go to college, you get a government job or a government contracting job, you get lots of degrees, all this into so that when even there are signals that maybe that's not right for you, or maybe yeah. that's not right and working, people default to thinking that's the way. And as a person who's kind of balked against that way, even though most of the things I just named I've done, <laughs> but I balked against it because I was like, I might have done it for different reasons. But as I show up doing even more different things, it's amazing to hear what people say to me. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, you just put all this at risk. Oh, you did that. Oh, like, what about this? And they're so worried for me. And I like, but I am intentionally exposing myself to a more fuller, richer life, in my opinion. So I don't default. But I feel like I have seen other people yeah. starting to question things a little bit more. But the theme running through this intention all too seem to come back to are you willing to have faith mm-hmm. in, in something you can't quite see? Like take the risk, even if there's not a sure bet, like you might learn something, you might experience something. And kind of to wrap it back to compassion, as I've done all these things and will continue to do it and continue to make stakes in the process and all this stuff, my compassion has gone way up, right? Because then you experience these things you never thought you'd experience when things go wrong or in a different direction. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, that's what that person meant. Or that's what they, like, no wonder they, like after cancer, sure you can let go of lots of material things and make different choices and everything after you've been something. Cause you're like, I'm alive. Yeah, right. I can buy it again. Yeah. So it just brought up lots of different things. The intention, how important. It really is, but there's there's a faith component to being willing to step into. Yeah. Uh, but then, like you said, miracles. Right. Exactly. That's right. And that's the rest of the quote where it says, um, so then lean, lean into it and watch for the miracles. Right. Watch for the miracles. And again, don't be desensitized. Don't be so sucked into constantly having 
the television on or the news or something like that, right? You know, it's like, you don't need all that noise in your life. You don't. And there are a lot of people who like, they're like, no, I need it. Like I got, I got to know. I'm like, but do you really need to like devote that much time, like a full hour? And then anyhow, yeah, I, I could go on and on and on about watching all of, all of that kind of stuff. And, um, and I will, I will put this little thing in there about the sports casters, you know, like after like, you know, like you watch like a football game or a basketball game, and then they have like the recap of it. And, and I, and, you know, I, I'm like, it's the, they're saying they sported, right? They sported and they sported some more and then they sported. You know? <laughs> it's like, I don't need to spend all my whole life doing that. Right. And so, and this is me. I know there's going to be some people listening. They're like, boo, Jen, boo, boo, hiss. You know, I love my sports. I'm like, great, good, good. I'm glad. I'm glad yeah. that you enjoy that kind of stuff. I'm just simply saying, like, is, are you using it to desensitize yourself? And I'm willing to poke that hornet's nest with people because, mm -hmm. and especially because I went through cancer, Rebecca, I used to do this to people. I wouldn't let people sit back because I'm like, every time I get on a podcast or I speak from a stage or have a coaching session with somebody or do a workshop or, or whatever, I don't know if I'm ever going to get a chance to cross paths with people again. I don't know. Oh, that's true. And so it's like, I, the intentionality that I live my life by is such that this may be the one time that one of your listeners hears this conversation. And I'm just simply saying, just stop and evaluate. Are you making the news or making a sports team that important? And if that is what is important to you, then great. Good. I'm glad that you figured it out. Right. But if you maybe, maybe it's you stop and you think about it, go, oh, I'm making it too important. Right. And let me give it its time and its place, but then let it go. Right. And what else, you know, how else can I be intentionally living my life? Because then you can start to see the miracles show up. But if you're just constantly focused on this other area and being distracted all the time, then it's really hard to see, very, very hard to see the miracles. I actually, um, in my morning, routine, I journal and I make a note in my journal. I create a space for me to write down the miracle, like just a miracle that I see that day. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the day, when I circle back to my journal and I just kind of fill in some thoughts, like I, I do some gratitude journaling at the end of the day and just kind of ponder on how things went. I have that spot already designated for the miracle. And it's it, in that moment, it forces me to stop and kind of think through my day and like, what was the miracle? What was the thing? You know, and sometimes it's finding that random lost item or it's, you know, you, you hear from somebody that leads to some cool thing or whatever it is. But it's that intentionality of starting my day, knowing that by the end of the day, I'm going to see a miracle. Yeah, you're, it's like you're drawing it to you by. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. There are times when I don't get around to starting my day that way. And there are some times where I don't get around to ending my day, reflecting back on it. And then like another day, like, cause I don't, I don't go more than like one or two days skipping it. Cause I, I don't know, it just, it just helps me be able to feel better. right. Yeah, exactly. Um, but then like a couple days later, I'm like, what have been my miracle? Like what? I know there's been some stuff that's happened. So it's really fascinating how quickly we'll forget it. And that's yes. just what I wanted to say is that if with that, in, without that intentionality, we'll skip past it. And then we're just kind of again, going through that wash, rinse, repeat that we, you know, that I set this whole little vignette up here in our conversation of wash, rinse, repeat. We're just going through the motions and we're not allowing ourselves to see these really cool things that are happening in our lives. And to me, I'm like, no, people see it, love it, embrace it. Talk about that. Talk about the miracles. Don't talk about the weather, please, for the love. Like as you're talking, I'm, I'm realizing, you know, that I think information addiction is a big thing right now. Mm -hmm. um, news, politics, yeah. um, social agendas of any kind, sports, all these things. And you think about it, when you're talking, I was realizing, you know, as we sit and consume information that people are sharing based upon them watching other people do stuff, which are what commentators do, right? right? And sports and politics and stuff. What that also means, the trade-off is you are sitting and listening to someone sitting, watching someone else do something. And we are creators. So our time might be better spent yes. creating something new, going off and smiling at someone, <laughs> doing the things 
And um, I've been on a kick lately on my daily walk, listening to near death experiences. Yeah. And through mm -hmm. that, it's been extremely in, uh, inspirational as I realized that one of the trends is like how important it is to be compassionate to others, to show up for others and just be kind in the smallest and simplest ways. And I've realized like I made a commitment to myself. I would, I need to write down the miracle every day. Like you were saying, I made a commitment to start acting on a nudge the minute I get it. Mm. And half the time I don't want to. So I'm like, the person doesn't want a little note from me. Mm -hmm. They don't give a rip about the like, whatever. I'm like, no, no, just do it. Just do the thing. And some people needed it. Some people may never tell me, you know what, but I've chosen to act more. Mm -hmm. And I think when you act more, you do start having more miracles, right? Because you are contributing to the world in those little ways needed. And that is intentional, right? I do that in the daily planning or the weekly planning, which fits your model and attitude. You know, the the five pillars, I, I those yeah. are my priority areas that I plan around. And um, it, it's just interesting to show this, uh, this all shows up. I'm like, this is all true. You were sharing principles and practices that you could use, you know, to implement this and to just, go, oh, this isn't something where you have to go spend a ton of money to go learn how to do. This is something yeah. you can just start deciding today. Yeah, right. Absolutely. For sure. And, um, you know, the N in compassion stands for like never ending compassion, right? And so... And my, my question there and the, the opening quote is why not, right? Why not have a focus on compassion? You know what I mean? Like yeah. this, this isn't going to, it's, there isn't going to be anything bad that's going to come from this. You know what I mean? And so, and, and there, I've had people say to me, yeah, but you know, I don't want to feel like I'm being taken advantage of, or I'm like, I'm like, okay, time out. That's like a whole nother thing around like boundaries and codependency like that, you know, like, no, that's not what I'm talking about. Right. But why not start with being compassionate for ourselves and recognizing I didn't handle that conversation with my kid as well as I could have, you know, <laughs> shout right. out to parents out there, you know, you know, or you know what? I, yeah, I probably could have used a different tone with my husband, you know, in that conversation or with my coworker or with the vendor or, 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 you know what I mean? And it's always fascinating to me how we can be delightful to total strangers, total strangers. You know, and then in our minds, like we're we're saying all the negative crap that we say about ourselves that we would never mm -hmm. say to anybody. You know what I mean? But then also the things that we do say to family members, right? Yeah. It to me it, again, it's like as you get into this <laughs> this journey of self discovery and recognizing, I want to be better. I want to do better. I want to take the opportunities. That's that intentionality, my friends. Right. And so why not? Like, why not lean into choosing compassion? Yeah. And I think especially in a world where, you know, you have the AI, you have a lot of technology, that kind of thing. I, I think that there's more of a yearning to have that human interaction mm -hmm. in some ways and to have the compassion for someone you can't get from all of this boilerplate <laughs> stuff out there worrying about you know, then very non-human elements, I guess, that are part of our work and lives by being so enmeshed in the technology and that kind of thing. And so I think some of these things that you're bringing up, at first glance, you could go, oh, compassion. Yeah, we all need to have it. But then talking about it more, realizing, oh, now's the time to step into it more in a world that um, has perhaps gotten away from it a little much. And I think we've all felt that in some situations in our jobs and lives. It, it's an attribute worth pursuing. And I think it helps everyone in life and jobs. And if I look back and see who has made most of a difference in my life, even if I look at past bosses and stuff, a lot of times it's those moments of compassion that you remember they had for you during a hard time or for a mistake or uh -huh. whatever that you remember. You don't remember some of the yeah. other things <laughs> that seemed yeah. important. Yeah. yeah, right. No, it's so it's totally true. Yeah. I was just thinking of, 
I had a boss years ago who, and yeah, before I got into all this coaching leadership stuff, I was in the recruiting industry for years and we had a really great account where we were helping them with um, help desk people, IT support folks oh. in this little call center. And so we owned that account. What basically that meant is that we had no competitors in there. It was, um, I'm not at liberty to share what the, what the company name is, but all of us have purchased clothes there and, or have a purchased clothes for our children from this very large clothing company. And so anyhow, so we like, we were the supplier. We would, we would bring them to IT support people. They would usually have them on contract for like three months and then they would roll them over to a full-time employee. It was a great way for these people to get into this company and then grow in their technical jobs and for them to get great employees and the whole try before you buy kind of thing, which is, which is a really brilliant model when it comes to contracting and, and temporary mm -hmm. staffing. Anyhow, mm -hmm. we find out that one of our competitors, another staffing company, was able to place somebody inside of this. And my boss at the time totally lost his cool. He would walk around the office with a golf club and he would like cut a little bit and he just kind of lean on it and stuff like that. And he just practices swing. And there's at the time, I'm going to say, I want to say around 25 to 30 of us that were in this office. So not a huge, huge office, but big enough. And so, and there was a lot of um, cubicles in the middle and low wall cubicles. So we could like talk and interact with each other. Okay. He was so ticked off, Rebecca. He took that golf club and he threw it. Ooh. A golf club, my friends. Yeah. A putter. That hurts. Okay. And it was spinning like a helicopter propeller just across and people were like ducking, you know, whatever. And he, there was some expletives that came out of his mouth. He was not a happy camper and he just stormed into his office and he slammed the door and everybody's like, oh, cause he's like, what are we doing? Like, why are we being so complacent that we allow the competition to come in? Mm. And so anyhow, I had just joined the company about six weeks before and I'm like, oh, Oh boy. And everybody's like, and I asked him, I'm like, is that normal? Like, does he normally? And they're like, oh, no, 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 that's, that's not normal. Cause he's like, oh. a like chill guy. Like we're good. Like we're working hard, you know, but it was like, like never with like that kind of explosive physicality of anger. Right. In addition to, you know, vocabulary that came out of his mouth. However, I was like, okay, just want to make sure like, this is kind of, you know, state of the union, right? The things yeah. that you don't hear about in an interview, you know, that's always fun. Mm -hmm. And so anyhow, I had this little nudge in my heart to go to his office and I'm like, I really don't want to do this right now. No, mm -hmm. homeboy needs to simmer down. And then the spirit was like, no, go talk to him. I was like, yeah. <laughs> so I walked over there, dunk, dunk, dunk. Hey. And I opened it and he's like, hi, come in. And he, so here I am, I'm the newbie on the team. And he just did this in front of me, right? He's like, I am so sorry that you had to see that. And he's like, I am, so, and I close it. And, and, and so anyhow, I'm like, can I talk to you for a minute? Like, like just, and so I close the door behind me. He's like, yes. And he's like, I'm so sorry. And he's really repentant and apologetic about it. And he's just like, I just can't believe that we let these people get in the door, et cetera. And I said, I think you need to stop with the apology right now. Like, what? And I said, if I were in your shoes, I'd be really upset too. Cause this is, a, this is basically telling us that we've gotten complacent. I said, I think it's a good thing that you shook people up. I said, you should hear what's going on out there. Like they're all like, Whoa, what did we do? And I'm like this. And I said, I said, I'm glad you did it. I said, I'm glad you didn't hit anybody with the golf club. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so he just stopped and he looked at me and he said, thank you. Thank you for saying that. I said, mm. you're welcome. And I said, is there anything I can do for you? He's like, no, I'm good. <laughs> I walked out. And so I like, I was there for like maybe two minutes in his office, maybe. But I think sometimes we get so scared and so tripped up to connect human to human. And I'm really glad that I took a moment to connect with him human to human. And trust me, I did not want to knock on his door, Rebecca. I was like, what? Mm -hmm. I am, who am I? Right. But for mm -hmm. whatever reason, I needed, I needed to tell that to him. And he was very, very appreciative. 
mm-hmm. that I basically validated like, yeah, this sucks. We need to, we need to do things better. And from that point, it was a turning point in the office. Things okay. got end up processes. I mean, there was a lot of things, you know, that it, it was good in a lot of ways and it was still good. They didn't hit anybody with the golf club, you know, but I think sometimes we're so scared to connect human to human, you know, we're so yeah. worried about doing that, but I just like, and again, this was a million years before I had cancer. And so, but I just was like, I just know I'm going to, I'm going to go say something. I just, I need to say yeah. something. So keep that in mind, you guys, like when you're thinking, like when you're getting that little prompting, that little nudge in your heart to go, like, it could be the most amazing, beautiful human to human opportunity. And that my friends is a great way to show compassion for somebody else, you know, and why not normalize this, right? That's kind of the last, you know, the glass quote, why not? Let's normalize it. It's okay to connect human to human. And what I love about the story you just shared is that it it wasn't just human to human. It was like you needed to be the person. Yeah. And that's why you got the nudge, right? Because maybe it wouldn't have meant the same coming from someone the person had worked with for three or four years. Right. It, it came from a completely unexpected person mm-hmm. who kind of stepped out there. And like what part of what I got from that is going we can show up in compassionate ways, keeping our personality, like keeping who we are and follow nudges to, to realize that, to not to judge who's going to be impacted by you, right? It could be someone that's completely different from you. I've had a lot of experiences where it had to come from someone completely unexpected. And it meant more in a way because I knew that there was no trying to please me, trying to get a special privilege or whatever. It it was was a pure intention. So as a wonderful, I like so many layers of that story. And I think it also showed that people also changed because this person normally exhibited some compassion and everything. And when they were out of sorts, people wondered, this is against their nature. There might be actually something wrong here. And it did like a reaction. So the, the power of being compassionate but also expressing yourself in other ways sometimes helps people wake up so I love all that whole thing I realize we could keep talking but (laughs) we we need to not talk all day but was there uh, something that we didn't touch upon that you feel like it would be important to like you're like oh I didn't say this and I really want to right to the discussion before we go Yeah, for sure. I appreciate that. You know, I think that there's an element of none of us know what's going to come down the pipe, right? Like none of us could plan for COVID. You know what I mean? Like I wasn't planning for colon cancer. Nobody in my family had cancer before. So it's not like I could be like on the lookout for it. Right. You know? Mm -hmm. And so sometimes these really big life altering, kind of shake you to your core things are going to come your way. And so that's why I tell people just do the work now to get your toolbox into place. And toolbox, in my opinion, is like all the books that you read. It's all the podcasts that you listen to. It's the coaching that you get from somebody. It's the the workshops that you attend. It's the the cute little quotes. Like I got like a little you know purple post-it note over here on my monitor with a cute little quote. You know what I mean? Like little things like that. Like to me, those are all the toolbox items. We need to build up our toolboxes because when stuff comes and it rocks you, that is not the time to be going to the hardware store to get your toolbox and get your tools. You have to have already done the work. You've got to already invest in yourself in advance. And then when the things come and they're going to come, then you can choose that intentionality, right? You can choose... you know, how am I going to communicate through this? How am I going to smile through this? You know, like the different things, right? And so that, and then that to me is an example of self-compassion. Like what can you do today, right? And so, you know, and of course, go on Amazon, go get the book, call for compassion, right? You'll get it there. Yes, thank you. And so, and you'll recognize it immediately because you'll see the cute little bike on the front. (laughs) That's the completed bike, the perfected bike. Get that, read it, you know, for yourself, share it with other people. Um, That was actually one of my favorite reviews on Amazon is not my favorite. They're all great. But somebody said, she's like, this is so good. I have bought it for other people too. Like buy this book, Mm -hmm. share it, you know? And so share that with people. And it'll make a, make a big difference. And I'm going to put a plug in for the call for compassion website. So call for compassion.com. 
if you go there right now, I'm, I have created a compassion manifesto for people who are watching this visually. There's actually a compassion manifesto framed on my wall here behind me, but you can get the call. You can get the compassion manifesto PDF that gives you the 10 things, the C O M P A all the way through. And so it's a nice little printable. So that's a freebie. I want your listeners, please go and get your, your hands on that. So build out your toolbox, my friends. Let's do it now because who knows what's coming tomorrow. Right. No, I think that's so good. And I'm I'm glad I was going to ask you where you wanted people to go. And you just shared at callforcompassion.com and get the book. It's it's a wonderful read. I can't remember how long it took me to read it, but it didn't feel like it was very long. And I even took notes. So I love that because in one or two sittings, you're reminded of what to do. You learn new things. And I just thought it was very well done. Thank Congratulations. You. And it was great talking with you. And I'm excited to see what comes of these efforts, what stories people continue to share with you. Because I'm sure they're going to be sharing more um, yeah. insights as they move along. But thank you, know. you again. Thank you. Appreciate your time. <laughs>